actually not using inflammation as one of those markers. So we believe that based on the information that's come out now, within the next year or so, that that's going to change and that we're going to have a new risk factor that they're going to be talking about. So in the old days, before a couple of years ago, we had drugs that could reduce people's inflammation, but they also did other things. So we talked about statins and those statin drugs to reduce your bad cholesterol can also reduce inflammation by a little bit. And then the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs that were good after a heart attack also reduce inflammation by a little bit. And then aspirin reduces your inflammation by a little bit also. Okay. So it was hard to tease out whether or not you were getting any of the benefits from this C reactive protein or whether or not the benefits were due to something else and that you were just getting this anti-inflammatory effect that wasn't really changing the natural course of anyone's disease. That changed with the release of this clinical trial called the CANTOS trial, which was a very large trial in people who had recently had a heart attack, recently had a stroke, or other atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease qualifying events. And they took those people and they put them on this a monoclonal antibody called canakinumab or placebo. And they had them on for uh, a significant period of time. And then they looked at the development of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And we'll show you the uh, results on another slide. Um, but let's look at who the people were. 88% had had a heart attack within the past 30 days. Most everyone had hypertension, and then a lot of people were already being treated with drugs that could slightly reduce the risk of inflammation. So we're talking about your ACE inhibitors or your ARBs, your statins. There are also people who were already on beta blockers, people who were on antiplatelet therapies. And remember that, you know, we said that that threshold, okay, uh, being above three is particularly important in terms of inflammation, these people were up above four. So they had very high CRP concentrations at baseline. And then another trial came out a few years later, which was very, very similar to the Cantos trial called the Colcott trial, except it used a drug that people had used for many, many years for the treatment of gout, colchicine, right? So here was a pain reliever, an anti-inflammatory pain reliever for gout that they were trying for this disease also. So what did they find in these two trials? Well, what they found was that in both the Cantos trial and the Colcott trial, that you could reduce the risk of a heart attack, a stroke, or the other combined atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease cause deaths with the use of those products. So somewhere between a 22% and a 33% reduction in those risks on top of being on a beta blocker, on top of being on a statin, on top of being on aspirin, and on top of being on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB that is already providing you with proven mortality benefits. So this is a really important finding because even if you're on all of those other drugs, Reducing inflammation with one of these two therapies is very effective. Now, the mechanisms of action are a little bit different, but ultimately they're impacting this inflammatory cascade at different points and reducing overall inflammation that's helping to stabilize that aspect of the patient's artery walls. So if you were gonna choose which of these two you wanted to use, I probably would suggest colchicine because it'll cost you $800 a year versus canakinumab, which would cost more than $200,000 a year. So canakinumab is a drug for an ultra rare disease that's caused with a lot of, uh, of inflammation, right? So it's only supposed to be used in several hundred people. So it's priced 
because of the small population that it's uh, being used in. But, you know, they did this clinical trial because they wanted to use it as a proof of concept, not because it was actually feasible to be using it in a very large population. So they went through afterwards and they did specifically this colchicine trial because they wanted something that you could use and to see whether or not it would give you a similar level of benefit. And it did. The colchicine results were, uh, were very good and open up the possibility that this could be a new treatment option for patients who had uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So some people will be asking themselves, well, I know that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs have the word anti-inflammatory in it. So that's be things like ibuprofen or naproxen, right? So your Motrin's and your Aleve's, if I took that, would I be reducing my risk of having a heart attack, having a stroke, or having those leg issues? And the answer is no. Because in addition to reducing inflammation, these drugs increase your blood pressure. They decrease your ability to get rid of salt in your urine. And so some of those negative effects that can increase the risk of heart disease help to take away the beneficial effects of decreasing inflammation. Now, aspirin, if you're using a relatively low dose, so less than one aspirin per day, and you could use up to, you know, so that would be 325 milligrams, using anywhere between 81 and 325 milligrams is not going to give you very much blood pressure increase. It's not going to be reducing your kidney uh, function by very much, and you're gonna get this good antiplatelet effect along with some anti-inflammatory effects. So aspirin's gonna give you two things that are good without the bad things that you can get from ibuprofen and naproxen, okay? All right, so the question would become, you know, well, if I have lupus and I have rheumatoid arthritis or I have psoriasis and they're putting me on one of these expensive drugs that can cost $50,000 a year or $30,000 a year in order to be able to treat that, do I need to take Colchicine? And the answer is we don't know. It may very well be that the potent anti inflammatory, expensive anti inflammatory drugs that you're taking with these biological drugs may be all that you need. And we need to do a little bit of additional research. Okay. Uh, so the answer is likely yes. And then they did look at another drug called methotrexate. And methotrexate is a non-biological drug for rheumatoid arthritis that's relatively inexpensive. And they studied it for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease also, and it didn't reduce any events. But they chose a very, very specific population that at baseline had a C-reactive protein level of around one. So they really didn't have a lot of inflammation. So we wouldn't have expected that we would have seen a lot of benefits from methotrexate. So what we don't want to say is that methotrexate certainly would not work because we don't know that that's true because they studied it in such a selective patient population. What they were really trying to find is that if you had relatively low inflammation and you reduced it to super low levels, did you get additional benefits? And the answer seemed to be no. So hopefully they're gonna be uh, repeating a trial that's like this with other less expensive anti-inflammatory options and then seeing whether or not they can reduce patients' risks also. Because you know not everyone can take any anti-inflammatory drug. There's some contraindications and there's some side effects that some people will get on one that they may or may not get on another. And having a couple of different options gives you some extra tools in your tool belt that you can use in individual patients. So that's the end of the first part. And then we'll turn it over to uh, David to open it up for the question and answer section. Hey, uh, thank you. Uh, just to remind <clears throat> remind everybody, uh, the easiest way to ask a question is to uh, unmute yourself temporarily by placing, uh, pushing down the space bar, ask the question, and then uh, release it. Um, so I'll open the floor to questions and uh, 
I have a question. Um, should we ask our doctors when we have our annual physical to test for C-reactive protein, and, and, you know, when they do everything else? Yeah, I think if you have had a stroke in the past that was uh, an ischemic stroke, if you're having intermittent claudication in your uh, in your legs, if you have angina or if you had a heart attack, that it's an interesting thing to uh, or an important thing to ask your doctor at this point whether or not they should also be looking at uh, at inflammation. What and if you're if just plain healthy like I am? Thank heavens. Yeah, if you're just plain healthy, uh, the benefit may not be worth the time that you would uh, uh, be putting in or the expense in uh, in doing it. Right now, they just don't know. Uh, there are some studies where they've looked at C-reactive protein to try to decide whether or not they should give people some extra intensity statin therapy or not, and that had some pretty provocative results. So if you're on the borderline right now of getting intensive or only getting moderate intensive therapies, then it could end up being something that can push you over the edge and make the doctor want to give you something that's uh, uh, that's a little bit more intensive, right? So if you're in the doctor's office and what they're saying is, well, you know, this could really go either way based on you, but, you know, because of this reason or that reason, you know, maybe we're going to go with moderate intensity therapy. It could be a good discussion to have with your doctor to see if they uh, have thought about this test, because if it comes back and it's really high, then maybe they should be going a little bit more aggressive. But for most healthy, regular people, it isn't something that you would have to ubiquitously add to, uh, to those labs. Could you go into more detail about rheumatoid arthritis and its relationship to heart health? Yeah, so they know that people that uh, have any of those inflammatory disorders, uh, all other things being equal, that your risk of heart disease is about doubled what it would be if you didn't have those other diagnoses. And those people have very high C-reactive protein concentrations. Almost everybody is uh, uh, is over three as a result of um, that chronic inflammation. But, you know, a lot of the drugs that they will use, you know, things like Humira and um, all those other tumor necrosis factor blocking drugs or the interleukin-6 blocking drugs that they, you know, use are already potent anti-inflammatory drugs. So we would assume that they would do the same kind of thing as canikinumab and colchicine, even though their mechanism of action is a little bit different, they're still blocking that inflammatory cascade. So I think one of the good things that came out when we looked at the combination of the Cantos and the Colcott trials is that two drugs that worked in a very different way in order to be able to block inflammation potently both had a beneficial effect. And that suggests that it's the blocking of the inflammation rather than the specific way in which you would block that inflammation that would be, uh, that would be worthwhile. Do I still use the medication for um, rheumatoid arthritis? Is uh, which drug? Cortisone. So, uh, yes, it is, but cortisone would be very much like the non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs in that it would cause uh, salt and water retention, could increase your blood pressure, and those kinds of things could help to take away some of the beneficial heart effects. So I wouldn't have as much confidence that that drug would actually reduce your heart risk and may actually make your heart risk go up, not because of its effect on inflammation, but because of some of these other effects. And then there's a bunch of other things with chronic uh, oral steroid use also, like you know, increasing um, blood sugar concentrations and increasing your risk of uh, having somebody who's pre-diabetic actually become a full-fledged diabetic during the time that they're taking the drug and making you less likely to be able to fight off some uh, some different types of uh, infections, especially some fungal infections. Um, that would make that not be a really good uh, first-line agent. So in the old days, before they had biological drugs, you would use something like methotrexate or azathioprine or gold therapy, where they would actually inject you with gold. That sounds very expensive. But 
uh, when that wasn't fully effective, they would use steroids just the minimum that they needed to give you back your functioning, even though they did a lot of other bad things to you, um, including, you know, helping to demineralize your bone over the course of time, increasing your risk of osteoporosis. Um, where now with the biological therapies, they could add drugs on top of the biological drugs like the uh, like Humira and uh, use methotrexate in addition to that drug or use something like azathioprine or cyclosporin so that a very, very, very few people actually need to use corticosteroids to treat their disease. Okay, I have a question. About, yeah, I have a question. What about if in the past you've been treated for AFib with metoprenol and propoprenol, but you haven't had a problem with it in several years, but the doctor told you to stay on a baby aspirin, would you recommend that? So uh, a baby aspirin a day, if you have a higher risk of having heart disease, it's probably worthwhile. They know that people who uh, just hit the age of 50 in the old days, they said, well, you know, if you're 50, you should start taking a baby aspirin because of that. Um, even if you had no previous heart disease, they're not making that recommendation anymore because they've done large clinical trials where they've used that strategy and they saw that the risk of GI ulceration, some of the risks of, uh, of bleeding associated with the, uh, with the aspirin um, actually became a wash with the benefits that you were supposed to be receiving. But it sounds like you might have some underlying heart disease and a baby aspirin is a good thing to, uh, uh, is a good thing to do in, in that case. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Professor, I have a uh, just a follow up on the baby aspirin. Um, yeah. I, I I have diabetes, so I, uh, my doctor has recommended that I take a baby aspirin. But uh, could you just elaborate a little bit more on on those gastro issues? Because I've been taking it for quite a while. Yeah. So uh, aspirin does two different things. It blocks. Uh, it blocks two different enzymes. One is called the COX-1 enzyme, and the other is called the COX-2 enzyme. The COX-1 enzyme and the COX-2 enzyme takes these precursors for the development of prostaglandins, and it decreases their production. Now, inside the platelet, the platelets take these prostaglandin, prostaglandin precursors, and they turn it into something called thromboxane A2. And that makes the platelets more likely to be sticky, where right? they'll stick to each other better, and it causes some of the artery uh, segments to constrict a little more than they would if they didn't have thromboxane A2. So when you use a low dose of aspirin, less than 325 milligrams, your platelets will be less likely to stick together. And that's how you get the, uh, the slight increased risk of, uh, uh, of bleeding. Now, in the stomach lining, you also have a COX-1 enzyme that makes those prostaglandin precursors, but the enzymes downstream turn it into something called PGE, and PGE increases mucus secretion in the stomach lining so that the stomach acid isn't touching the cells on your stomach wall because you have this mucus protective layer. So when you're taking aspirin, you have less protective mucus and you have an increased risk of developing an ulcer. If you've been taking it for more than three months and you haven't had an issue at that dose, then there's a very good chance that you can just continue and that your risk is going to be relatively uh, relatively low. Now, some things can change that. If your life suddenly becomes incredibly stressful and your acid levels are going up or uh, something else happens that ends up you know, causing some damage to your stomach lining, the aspirin could help to worsen the amount of damage that you would get in the future. But in general, the risk is mostly within the first few months of therapy. And if you haven't had uh, an issue, then chances are you'll do relatively well. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have a question? And, and just remind people, if you're on the phone, star six six will uh, unmute you. And uh, Professor uh, White will also have questions at the end. 
Okay, yes. I have another question about statins. Uh, I read somewhere that uh, they were the research was only done on people with heart attack issues. What about people who are perfectly healthy? Uh, they should not. Uh, what do you think about their taking statins? Yeah, so there's two different classes of clinical trials that have uh, that have been done. The first clinical trials are in people who had proven coronary disease. Most of those people have already had uh, a heart attack um, or they already have angina and they call that secondary prevention. And they show that you could significantly reduce somebody's risk of dying by about a quarter. Then they did another series of trials where they looked at statins in people who had high risk of having cardiovascular disease, but didn't have cardiovascular disease at baseline. And those trials showed that you could reduce the risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease by about a third, uh, but the trials were not powerful enough individually to show that you could reduce somebody's risk of, uh, risk of dying. But when you took all of those individual trials, the biggest was the biggest three were called the AFCAPS and the TEXCAPS study, the West of Scotland study, uh, and the lipid trial, and you put them all together, with the increased power you were able to show in a meta-analysis that you could also reduce somebody's risk of uh, of dying with that also. So statins are really, really good for people who have high cholesterol, whether or not they have uh, heart disease at the present time or not. The dose that they'll pick for you is going to be related to your risk of developing heart disease over the next 10 years. And you can go online and put in the American Heart Association risk calculator, and you can put in your own risk factors, and it'll tell you what that, uh, what that risk is. So if you have high risk, then they'll want you to have an LDL level or a bad cholesterol level that's below 100, right? And then if your risk is moderate, then they would want you to have it be around 130. And then if your risk is much lower, then it would be around 160. So they'll choose the intensity of therapy that you need based on what your underlying risk is going to, uh, is going to be. So, does that make sense? But I'm very, uh, I don't like to take drugs. I'm very lucky I don't take any prescribed drugs. And I my um, bad uh, cholesterol is just a little bit too high uh, to please my doctor, but I just can't see taking the risk of taking a drug. Yeah, so, you know, the, the thing is, though, that, uh, that the data is actually pretty good, that over the next 10 years, that you'll get more benefits than you would have uh, than you would have risks, especially if you could take one of the drugs at like a yeah, a lower intensity, that might get you some of those uh, get you some of those benefits. So you know one of the first things they'll try for some of those people is some lifestyle modifications. But there are some people that genetically, even though their diet is good, even though they're exercising, uh, it's still a little bit too high. Right, and I think that, you know, one of the best things when you're talking to people is that, you know, once you have a heart attack or once you have a stroke, there's going to be a part of your heart or there's going to be a part of your brain that's going to be damaged and you're not going to get that area to work fully normal again, right? And we don't know when that's going to happen. All we know is that your risk of having something like that happening is at a certain percentage. Right? So if you go in and use the risk calculator, you can look at the overall risk and then try to see, well, what would happen if my risk was reduced by 30%, right? So if I had a 5% risk and it went down to a 3% risk, is that, is that a risk that I'm willing to take in order to be able to, uh, uh, to justify using that drug? So you can see that if your risk is 50%, and it would go down, you know, where you had a one in two chance of having a heart attack and you could make that be a one in three or a one in four chance. But that would be a pretty significant reduction. And then everyone would say, oh, yeah, I would do that. Right. But if your risk is 5% and you're only reducing it to 3%, is that really worth it to you? And, that, and that's a question that between you and your doctor, you would have that discussion and you would uh, and you would make it out. Does that make sense? That makes excellent sense. Thank you.
What is the relationship between what used to be called an enlarged heart 50 years ago and an aortal aneurysm? So uh, an aneurysm is where you have an, a part of your aorta that is weakened. And so with your normal blood pressure, it's making it start to balloon outwards in this one spot. And as it balloons out, you know, just like if there's uh, a part of a balloon that's weakened, you get this like secondary little balloon that comes out and it's much thinner. And at a certain point, it'll rupture. And then a lot of your blood flow will end up just leaving and, and not be going through your normal arteries, but just be, you know, flowing outside of the blood vessels. And that means you wouldn't get you know, uh, enough uh, oxygen and stuff going to your entire body because the blood is just rushing out of your vasculature. An enlarged heart is caused by one of two things. So one, uh, if you look at a chest x-ray and your heart is big, but then you do an echo and the echo, you like cut the heart in half and you look at it, sometimes the heart is really big and the walls are really thick and they call that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Sometimes what's happened is that the walls are very thin and stretched out and that's called dilated cardiomyopathy. And in either cases, those are big risk factors for the developing of something called heart failure. So people who have had hypertension or people who have aortic stenosis very often have a very thickened heart and they'll be at risk for uh, for heart failure due to that. And they would call that heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Other people have had a heart attack or they've taken chemotherapy that helped to poison some of their heart and their heart's not pumping normally. And just all of the blood that's coming into your heart ventricle when your heart's trying to pump it out, your heart has a has a problem pumping it all out and it stretches the heart out and it makes it dilated. And they will call that heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And they have a lot of good drug treatments for people who have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And they now have one good therapy for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And that is an area of a lot of, uh, a lot of research now. Thank you. Right. Can Thank you, you tell me what have the test I... is for the C-reactive protein? Uh, what was that? You know what the, I'd like to know what the test is for the C-reactive protein. Yeah, so, uh, so there are two different C-reactive protein tests. If you have an, a big inflammatory disease like rheumatoid arthritis or you have uh, lupus or something like that, they could just do a regular C-reactive protein and it will put you in the neighborhood of what your uh, C-reactive protein level is. For heart disease, what they would do is that if your regular C-reactive protein was relatively uh, stable, they could still do what they call the HSCRP or the highly specific C-reactive protein test. And that will give you a much finer reading of what your level of inflammation is. So when we were talking about the CANTOS trial, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, the, the Colchicine trial, they were using HSCRP. And what you wanted is you wanted a level that was closer to one and definitely a level that was less than three, right? And in that trial, the levels that they had were, were a touch over four in both of those trials. So very, very high inflammation. Can you uh, explain so specific now, blood if, test? If you have a, looking for an uh, anti gout medication, why was colchicine chosen instead of allopurinol? Yeah, so allopurinol and probenicid are drugs that reduce uric acid levels. And uh, so they're not uh, an anti inflammatory drug per se, right? They're, that's actually treating the underlying cause. So when you have too much uric acid, Right, uric acid, when your DNA and your RNA is breaking down, it turns it into uric acid. And if your uric acid concentrations are too high, 
the crystals begin to settle out of your blood and they and they crystallize uh, in low blood flow areas like your big toe or like in your uh, finger joints. And then your body looks at those crystals and they say, well, that doesn't look like a normal part of me. And the immune system attacks those crystals. And that's what they would use colchicine for, right? To decrease the inflammatory response to those crystals, but they wouldn't make those crystals go away. It doesn't happen in the United States, but there are uh, some physicians and uh, pharmacists and nursing teams that'll go to uh, South America, will go over to Africa, and there'll be people who hadn't seen a doctor in like 30 years or so that'll come in and their arm will be welded shut. They can't open it or close it because the uric acid crystals have actually settled out in those joints and have welded the uh, the joint shut. And there are other people that can move it, but when they move it, it's this horrible grating sound in and out as the joints are pushing past all of the uric acid crystals that uh, that they have. And if you put them on allopurinol and you put them on uh, uh, a drug like probenicid over the course of time, you can get rid of a lot of those crystals and you can get back some mobility. Although in most of the people, it's never gonna get completely back to uh, to normal. Any other questions? Okay, well, why don't we move on to the second session? Okay, great. So now we're gonna go from the area where we have a lot of really good large clinical trials with many years worth of follow-up data and into an area that's just starting to emerge. Okay, so uh, actually to uh, make it be equally as uh, uh, of equal length, we actually had a couple from the last that were still part of this. And this is, are there any things I can do with my lifestyle that can decrease inflammation, right? So if I didn't want to take colchicine, if I didn't want to take canukinumab, is there anything I can do to be able to reduce inflammation? So I put those things here on, uh, on this slide. So what you need to know is that these weren't, uh, uh, that these things um, like injecting illegal drugs. So a lot of people who are using illegal drugs, you know, you think that you're injecting heroin, but really you're injecting synthetic fentanyl along with uh, other junk that they put in it in order to make it seem more like heroin. Or you think that you're using cocaine, but very few people actually get pure cocaine and what you're actually getting is an amalgam of a bunch of different uh, stuff, some uh, chemicals that are, uh, you know, that none of them are uh, FDA approved and they're put in in order to give you a feeling kind of like you're using uh, cocaine. But with all of that stuff that's within those, uh, those drugs and the crystals that you're injecting, you can get a lot of inflammation. So, you could stop using and uh, injecting illegal drugs and then your inflammation level would go down over the uh, course of time. So that, that's an easy one. The second one is inhaled particulates or inhalation of different chemicals. So they know people who are smoking that smoke has, and even vaping has heavy metals that you're inhaling into your lungs. So some of those heavy metals were inside the tobacco that they use either for the cigarettes, for the cigars, or for uh, the vaping stuff. Or with vaping, um, what happens is that as the battery is being pushed against this, uh, this fatty matrix that's holding the vaping liquid, that some of the heavy metals from the battery is actually getting liberated in the air and then you're breathing it down into your lungs. Or some of the waxy part on the outer area of that cartridge that you're using for vaping um, gets aerosolized and then you breathe it into your lungs. And then when it's not incredibly hot because of that battery and it goes to just what regular body temperature is, that that waxy residue begins to settle out in some of your lung fields 
and can cause inflammation as your body, you know, responds to uh, having a candle on the inside of your uh, lungs. There are some people that are breathing in a lot of particulates because they live in major metropolitan areas or because in their house they had lead paint and the lead paint is, you know, now being, uh, even though they did away with lead paint in the 80s, that there's still lead paint in the air from the paint that they had had, you know, from many different paintings ago. Alcoholic and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, right? So people that chronically abuse alcohol, one of the things that happen is that you get this redistribution of fat into your liver that helps to start to damage your liver and that can cause body-wide inflammation. People who have very high triglyceride concentrations in their blood. So one of the things that they measure along with your bad cholesterol is also your triglyceride concentration. And if that's really, really high, that can cause you to have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease over the course of time. So what are some of the things that you can do if your doctor tells you that you have fatty liver disease, right? Well, you can limit or reduce your intake of alcohol, which actually has a lot of carbohydrates in it, right? They're fermenting grains, they're fermenting grapes, right? So things that have a lot of sugar, things that have a lot of carbohydrate in it. Limit the intake of excessive amounts of refined carbohydrates and sugar. So making sure that your carbohydrates are coming in the form of something that has a lot of fiber in it, right? Not some of the uh, refined carbohydrates. So eating an apple instead of drinking apple juice, right? Eating something that was a whole grain instead of eating something that was uh, like Wonder Bread. Some people uh, that are prone to having ulcers have this bacteria in their stomach that's called H. pylori. And if you treat the H. pylori and you get rid of it, you know, this stomach bacteria, that not only are you less likely to get ulcers, but your total body level of inflammation can also start to, uh, to go down. For fats, they know that trans fats and saturated fats so trans fats are the kind that they use in, uh, uh, in processed type foods, um, a little bit of concentration in trans fats in something like uh, red meat, but in saturated, you know, a lot of saturated fats in things like, uh, uh, like red meat. Um, so using more olive oil, using more canola oil or flaxseed oil in your baking and using less things like Crisco or other types of shortening or margarine or butter. So, you know, butter had a lot of saturated fats, so they thought they were doing a good thing by creating margarine, but the margarine was all just trans fats and the trans fats were found to be equally as bad for your heart once they ended up doing those, uh, those studies. So by using more olive oil, canola oil, and flaxseed oil and using less bacon grease, shortening, margarine, or butter, you're going to do better. And then also, uh, obese subjects have more chronic inflammation than leaner people. So weight loss is incredibly hard for people to do and to maintain over time, but it's also a very important thing that you can do for your heart in a number of different ways. It can reduce inflammation, yes, but it can also reduce your blood pressure and reduce your blood sugar concentration. So in a lot of different ways, weight loss can be very, very good for your heart. So instead of doing all of those hard things on that other slide, like stopping smoking and doing weight loss, can you try to circumvent that with using a dietary supplement? Let's go through some of the different uh, potential options. The first one is uh, turmeric. Turmeric by itself has something in it that's called curcumin. And curcumin actually does have some anti-inflammatory effects. Okay, but if you're just using turmeric by itself, you're not going to absorb enough of the curcumin in order to be able to have a good biological effect. So our research group 
we did a meta analysis of all the trials that looked at C reactive protein, and we found that uh, you can reduce the level of C reactive protein when you use this curcumin extract of turmeric. We found that if you can take it and turn it into a paste, and then you can put it on mouth sores, that it can help help those mouth sores called oral lichen planus heal quicker by taking away some of the chronic inflammation that's associated with those mouth sores. And then in people who had fatty liver disease, in this case, it was non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, that taking the curcumin extract of turmeric can help to reduce how much fat that there is in your liver, and in that way, try to reduce some of the inflammation. What we don't know is because it hasn't been studied in heart disease patients, what would happen for atherosclerotic cardiovascular events? I have some level of confidence since it reduces C-reactive protein, that it'll give you some benefits, but it's not reducing it anywhere near the extent as what you would get with colchicine or with canikinumab, so it's not gonna give you as much overall benefit. Back in the day, everyone was really excited about vitamin E and vitamin C and beta carotene as these antioxidant vitamins. But when they did those large clinical trials, they showed that there was no cardiovascular benefit and there was actually no benefit in decreasing the risks of cancer. One alcoholic beverage a night, so wine with your dinner, that can be good can reduce your inflammation. People know that that's true. Whether it's due to this effect or whether it's due to the other alcohol uh, type effects like the mild relaxation type effect that you can get with a, a single alcoholic beverage, uh, that they don't know. But a single alcoholic beverage may provide you with, uh, with some benefits. If you're gonna take more than two, especially if you're a woman and especially more than three if you're a man, your cardiovascular risk is actually going to be increased rather than being decreased. So if you wanna go the route of trying an alcoholic beverage as your anti-inflammatory strategy, one drink a night, right? And one drink is not one bottle. It's not 32 ounces, okay? It's whatever the uh, standard drink amount would, uh, would be. So now let's move on to uh, drug interactions associated with inflammation. So here's the one that's a little more uh, uh, theoretical on the cutting edge and a little less clear. But I think that you guys will like this overall discussion because you know maybe you haven't thought about when you take a drug, how the drug ends up coming on and working. So here at time zero, you swallow that pill. It doesn't immediately start to give you beneficial effects. It takes a while for the drug to start to get absorbed from the stomach going through the liver and getting into the bloodstream so that the blood concentration is high enough that you're going to get a therapeutic effect. So when you take a blood pressure reducing drug, your blood pressure is not significantly reduced by that initial dose for a couple hours after you take it. If you have a headache and you take a headache drug, you're gonna get no benefits within the first 30 or 40 minutes, and you're not gonna get really good effects for an hour or two, right? Because you need to get a concentration above this minimum effective concentration. As the concentrations continue to increase, you'll hit the peak concentration that you would have during that dosing. And they call that your maximum concentration or your Cmax. At that point, the drugs are going to start to go down in your body. And when the drug goes below the minimum effective concentration, even though there's drugs still in your bloodstream, it's not enough to give you a good overall benefit. Okay. Now, if your drug concentration went high enough that it goes past the toxic level, now you'll start to have significant adverse effects. So they try to dose people with different drugs to get people within the therapeutic range so that their blood concentrations are between the minimum effective concentration and the minimum toxic concentration in the body. Okay. 
And then the last term we want to talk about is the AUC or the area under the curve. This is the person's total exposure to this drug over the course of time. So look at a minute and just, you know, familiarize yourself with what this curve looks like as the drug concentrations go up and then they begin to come down after you take a drug. So now that curve is being repeated over the course of time. What happens if you're taking a chronic drug therapy, right? Over the course of time, you don't have that termination of effect like you did when you just took a single drug, like something for a headache. Because as the drug concentrations are starting to come down, you're taking a second dose. Then you're taking a third dose. And by the time you get to that fifth dose, you've now achieved a steady state concentration where if you continue to take the dose as it is prescribed, this repeating curve that you see there, right? So you can see that initially when you took that second dose, that your maximum concentration was a little higher than when you took your first. And when you took that third, it was a little bit higher than when you took when you took the fourth, it was a little bit higher, but once you got to that fifth dose, you now have achieved a steady state and then taking your other chronic medications, either once a day or twice a day are gonna to help to maintain that concentration at that higher level. So what kind of things can make one person have a good effect from a drug, right? So let's say that you're down at the gym and you're talking to somebody else and you're both taking the same dose of the medication and for you, it's working really well. For somebody else, it's not working at all. And for that third person, it was working well, but they had a lot of side effects, right? Well, one of the things is that maybe in one of those individuals, the drug didn't dissolve normally. In some people, maybe more or less drug made it through the liver and made it into the bloodstream. Because in some of those people, maybe their liver function was compromised by a drug interaction. Maybe it was compromised by significant liver disease. Maybe it was alcoholic or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or maybe it was hepatitis A, B, or C. Was the drug able to penetrate into the site of action? So very often the drug isn't working in the bloodstream, right? The drug is working somewhere else and the drug has to get out of the bloodstream and has to get through something like the blood brain barrier to get over to the brain where it can cause some effects in the central nervous system or get out and go to where the joint is so that it can help to have the effects in the, in the joint that you wanted to see. Were the receptors for the drug normal? So sometimes your blood concentration is the same as somebody else's, but your receptor number or your receptor function is normal where with somebody else is abnormal. So they actually need higher concentrations to get the same kind of effect that you had gotten because their receptors are not working normally, okay? If the receptors are normal, are normal, sometimes they, the receptors causes different things to happen, like channels to open that allow ions like sodium or potassium or calcium to go into or out of the cell. Well, if those channels are broken, even if the receptors are normal, maybe you don't get good effects. Can the body break down the drug once it gets into your bloodstream? And then are there any active metabolites? And can your body break down those active metabolites? And then finally, can the drug or the active metabolites be removed normally through the kidney? So you see how it can be really, really complicated and how an individual patient might respond very, very differently to a drug than the average patient. And that's why we always try to tell the pharmacy students when you're working with patients, you need to look at the patient knowing that a lot of them are going to be close to average, but that very few people are gonna exactly be the average. And some people are gonna be very far away from the average, right? We all make up the average, but very few people are exactly the average patient for any disease or disorder. So we need to tailor things to that individual patient to give them optimal outcomes. So here we see that uh, in green, we have the gastrointestinal tract and you got the drug that's been digested 
and then the drug is starting to get absorbed, that it goes through the liver first. And then the drug ends up making it into the bloodstream where it's going to go through the body. And as it goes through the body, it's going to go through the liver again, periodically, and the liver is going to have the ability to metabolize the drug. So it has the ability to metabolize the drug before it ever reached the bloodstream. And then it also has the ability to metabolize the drug as the blood from the bloodstream goes back through the liver. Now, the liver does a ton of different things. It creates a bunch of different proteins. Proteins that you need to carry vitamins, proteins that you need to carry hormones like testosterone and estrogen through the body, proteins that you need to carry iron through the body. It produces a lot of the immune system proteins. And it's a place where macrophages, one of the white blood cells, end up getting stored. It also metabolizes the drugs and takes some of the drugs and ends up putting it into the bile that end up getting eliminated in your feces. So I tried to show it here as a scale because if you make the immune system response go out of whack for a long period of time and the liver has to produce a lot of immune system proteins, it's going to shunt production of that and it's actually going to make less metabolizing enzymes. And that's going to decrease its ability to metabolize drugs over the course of time. So I don't know if you've ever heard of the cytochrome P450 system, but it's an enzyme system in the body that helps to metabolize a lot of the drugs that people end up taking. So to start out, somebody had taken uh, beef liver and they ground it up and they put it in a centrifuge and they whirled it around really, really quickly. And then they took out that test tube and they looked at it and they saw there was a level that was pigmented so it was highly colored. So they threw everything else away, decided to devote their lives to studying this P layer of the liver. And they tested it and they found out that it had a lot of iron in it. So they called it a cytochrome and it became the cytochrome P layer of the liver. And then when they tested it with this test called NMR, it ended up spiking and showing in that area. So since they uh, at 450 nanometers, so they called it the cytochrome P450 system. And they found out that this system, they have this iron and the iron is being held by carbons at these four points. And an oxygen comes next to the iron and the iron tears off one of its electrons and it shoots it down this electron transport chain causing this oxygen-free radical to be formed. And when a drug comes close enough to the oxygen-free radical, the oxygen-free radical wants to share an electron and it gets stuck on the molecule. Well, what does that really do? Well, it turns a drug into either an active or an inactive metabolite. So let's say that I'm a drug and right now I'm giving whatever my pharmacologic effect is out to you. And I'm going through the liver and I get an oxygen that's stuck right here next to my mouth and it makes my mouth unable to work. I become an inactive metabolite. But let's say the oxygen is stuck on my arm. I can still talk all I want to, but now I have this oxygen over here. I've been turned into an active metabolite. So if I'm an active metabolite, what really happened? Well, if you have an exposed oxygen, the next time that I find myself going through the kidney, I'm less likely to get reabsorbed and I'm more likely to end up in the urine. Okay, so it enhances clearance of the drug when you stick an oxygen on a molecule. A lot of important drugs end up going through the cytochrome P450 system and the liver makes those cytochrome p450 enzymes all right so what's emerging is that in people who have chronic inflammation that the livers are making more inflammatory proteins and they're making less of these enzymes so this is what they're starting to find 
in the beginning of this gray box, the people start to have inflammation. And because they start to have inflammation and they're making less enzymes to be able to break down this drug, the drug concentration starts to rise from the steady state it was at up to this new steady state that's at a higher concentration. And if you can resolve that inflammation, it'll go back down to what it would normally be. And after five half-lives, it would go back down to the lower steady state. In a lot of different diseases that can cause inflammation, what they've been able to show is that in at least some of these cytochrome P450 isoenzymes that you can decrease activity. Okay. So if you had a drug that was going through one of these specific enzyme systems, that your drug concentrations would end up going up as a result. Okay, and then they tried to correlate it with different parts of the inflammatory cascade and they were able to show in some cases that it was negatively correlated with CRP. The higher your C-reactive protein level, the less ability you had in order to be able to metabolize drugs through the cytochrome P450 3A4 system or the 2C19 system, okay, and uh, with some, there was specific inflammatory mediators like interleukin-6 or tumor necrosis factor alpha. So how much blockade are we talking about here? Okay, so the data on the previous slide is data from human studies, but the studies are observational studies. They just looked at this population in that study or in that population, they weren't experimental studies where they gave some people placebo and they gave other people active drugs and then they looked at it. So what this means is that what I provided over the last couple of slides, that the strength of evidence is low or at best moderate for each of those diseases. So that means it's a promising area of research and something to keep in mind, but it isn't necessarily something that uh, we have a lot of confidence in and that we're going to change the general practice for how we're dosing drugs at this time as a result. But it doesn't mean that if you were doing really well on a drug before and then you develop this inflammatory disease and then you start getting some of the side effects of the drug, that it's not actually due to a real phenomenon. It may be due to something that's real through this potential mechanism. And then hopefully as time goes on and more research is done, we'll know whether or not or to what extent this is a true phenomenon and how serious this phenomenon is. So uh, with some of them, it was a 20 to 30% increase in concentrations. With others, it was about a 10 to 15% increase in drug concentrations as a result. That's something. If you were right on the borderline of being too high, it could be enough to give you some of those extra adverse effects. Okay, for the average person, it's probably not going to make much difference at all. So many people might not even notice a difference, but other people may notice. So here, what we're talking about is a new area of research that we're starting to look into, especially within the geriatric population. So now we're going to go through, talk about our conclusions. We can now say with a lot of confidence that chronic inflammation is bad for the blood vessels and that the use of drugs that can reduce inflammation potently, like canukinumab and colchicine, that you can not only reduce inflammation, you can also reduce atherosclerotic cardiovascular events like heart attacks and strokes. And that this occurs in addition to all the other drugs that were known to reduce events. We know that lifestyle or, di or dietary modification can reduce chronic inflammation, but we don't know to the extent to which it's gonna reduce atherosclerotic cardiovascular events or other negative health events. 
we can now cautiously say that if dietary supplements can reduce C-reactive protein concentrations and not do something else that's bad, like increasing blood pressure or increasing blood glucose or making uh, your blood more, uh, you know, thicker or more viscous, that those things may also reduce cardiovascular events, but we don't have a lot of that information, so our confidence is a little bit lower. We know that chronic inflammation is a newly discovered cause of people not being able to metabolize some key drugs in the body as well. And it could be a reason why people who did not experience adverse effects before may start to experience some of those adverse effects. So if you have a new inflammatory disorder and your drugs are starting to cause more adverse events, this could possibly be a reason. So you can talk to your doctor or your pharmacist. Okay, so now we're up to our final question and answer discussion, and I'll uh, send it over to Dave, who can open it up for questions. Okay, uh, Professor, that was very interesting, a little complex, but very interesting. Uh, so I'll open the floor again. What effect do uh, medications taken after a kidney transplant have on your heart? Uh, say that one more time. What effect do medications taken after a kidney transplant, how do they affect your heart? Yeah, so those drugs are also immune suppressing type drugs. And those drugs as a result may be uh, having a beneficial effect overall on, uh, on the heart. They would be helping to counteract some of the increased inflammatory effects that you might be getting from just having a transplant by itself, right? So is it making you better than if you never needed to have a transplant? Probably not, but it's helping to prevent you from being worse because you needed to have the transplant, right? So you got the benefit of the new organ without the bad effects of inflammation hurting your, uh, your blood vessels and causing an increased risk of heart attack. Thank you. Right, and so when we looked at that uh, data with methotrexate and the people's C-reactive protein started out being very low at baseline, they didn't have any reductions in their uh, cardiovascular events because in them, they didn't have increased inflammation. In your case, with this new uh, organ, the body's gonna look at it and say, oh, that's not me. And it's gonna ramp up inflammation against it you're taking drugs to prevent that from happening. Any other questions? I actually have one more. Uh, you, you talked about uh, dietary uh, lifestyle changes, and I believe you mentioned exercise uh, briefly, but could you just elaborate a little bit about exercise, and, and especially in, con in combination with some of these other lifestyle changes? Yeah. So. Uh, exercise is a very good uh, thing for people to uh, to do. Um, it reduces your triglyceride concentrations. It doesn't really have a lot of effect at reducing your bad cholesterol, but it does reduce your overall blood pressure, right? And it helps to use the blood glucose that you have a lot more of. Right? It can help to promote a little bit of weight loss, but much more so help to promote weight maintenance. Right? And all of those things are independent predictors of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Right? So if you can reduce blood pressure and at the same time you can reduce your risk of diabetes and at the same time you can lose some weight, right? all of those things are going to come back in and be a beneficial thing for you to uh, for you to have. Um, you know, you want to start your exercise regimen and you want to do it sensibly. You don't want to go from, you know, not having exercise for 37 years uh, and then you're doing an Ultraman uh, competition. That's probably not really good. The other good thing about uh, or very interesting thing about exercise is that for people who do no exercise, versus people who run up to a 5k that your overall 
risk of having heart disease or your risk of death actually goes down. But as people start to go above 10K and start to go into doing marathons and ultra marathons, you actually begin to lose some of the beneficial effects of exercise. And they believe that what's happening is that they're overstressing their body. And through that overstressing, they're actually damaging things like their heart, right? So uh, we've all seen the ads, you know, that, uh, you know, pain is weakness leaving the body. Well, no, pain is actually a good indication that you kind of gone where you should be. And now is the time to uh, to back it down a little bit, right? If your elbow is really, really, really sore and you just keep doing what it was that you were doing before, you're going to have more damage to your joint than if you listen to the pain response and you didn't uh, and you didn't do it, right? So a little bit of discomfort may be okay if you push through it. You have to talk with your uh, you know your doctor, your physical trainer, um, you know for what is good feelings of pain, which is what is uh, versus what is bad feelings of pain. But the ultra marathoners don't live longer than the people that are running five k's, and I think that's a really important take home message. So getting out and walking, getting out and doing moderate exercise, all of those things are really, really important. Going to the gym and putting on a little bit of additional muscle mass, even if you're not benching 320, just the act of going out and burning some of those extra calories and going out and moving your body and building some of that muscle mass is going to have a lot of benefits for you. The other thing with exercise, depending on the exercise that you do, is it helps to increase your stability, especially as you get older, making you less likely to be prone to uh, to slip and fall, right? And so February is now over. The people's risk of slipping and falling is going to start to go down precipitously through the summer, but winter will be here again. Uh, and in those cases, exercising uh, between now and next winter will help you make will help make you a little bit more sure on your uh, on your feet as a result. I guess I'll give up. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 I just ask, is running a 5K really any better than walking for an hour a day? Probably not, but it takes a lot more time. So, uh, yeah. I recommend yes, sure. share yoga for seniors online. It's a wonderful exercise. And can I ask you, um, Charles, what about the difference between uh, low calorie sweetened and sugar? Yeah, so uh, low calorie sweeteners, uh, as a general rule, do not reduce your blood sugar uh, versus using regular sugar. And it sounds like it's crazy, okay? Uh, because one has calories, and the other doesn't have calories. But what they believe is happening is that the craving that you have for sweet things is so intense that you're actually eating more caloric stuff, especially sweeter stuff, as a result of using non-calorie sweeteners. Um, it may be a little bit different with, uh, with stevia than it is with all of the others. Uh, stevia has something in it that's called Reb A as its uh, as its sweetener, and uh, the preliminary evidence suggests that it may be a little uh, a little less in that category than uh, than the others. So drinking water or drinking tea or drinking seltzer would be a lot better than uh, drinking an artificially sweetened beverage. In terms of what it would uh, ultimately do to uh, your ability to be able to maintain calorie control over the uh, over the course of the of the day, so it sounds crazy, but uh, they now have good enough evidence to suggest that a regular sweetener actually doesn't help to promote uh, weight loss. It doesn't help to promote uh, blood glucose concentrations going down, so your blood sugars won't. Uh, won't be decreased if you're the average person. Any other questions? 
Professor, uh, you may also want to just point out your uh, your videos that you talk about on your last slide. Uh, again, I will uh, send the slides out to anybody who wants them, uh, and my email is up in the chat room. But uh, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Uh, those twenty videos. Yeah, so we have uh, students that um, have been working with me and another faculty person in order to put out information about the COVID nineteen vaccine. So if you want to know whether or not the COVID-19 vaccine is made out of uh, fetal tissue, if the COVID-19 vaccines have formaldehyde in them, uh, if it can change your DNA, right? Each of these are individual questions that we go through and uh, answer. And we have students that have gone through who either they or their uh, parents were really fluent in speaking um, other languages, and they've ended up translating a lot of that information into uh, into other languages. So we got a lot of them in Spanish. We have all of them in Mandarin and Cantonese. And then each week we're getting an additional one in uh, in Polish. So we're a little behind in getting Polish translations. I think we're up to uh, to four uh, in Polish at the at the present time. And then the other thing is that uh, I have I actually have two. I have one that just came out um in uh, uh in the conversation um on uh, on monday but this was the one that was before that looking at uh at zanpac and uh something that is uh, that's new so if if any of you were taking angiotensin receptor blockers or metformin you probably were uh, made aware that some of the manufacturers actually had some of this chemical called NDMA inside some of those products. And that that chemical was a cancer causing uh, chemical and that the concentrations were higher than the FDA wanted. So they caused a lot of recalls to happen. The same kind of thing happened with Zantac products where those products were also uh, recalled. When the FDA went through and explored it, they found out that with the angiotensin receptor blockers or with uh, metformin, that the problem was in the way that they were being manufactured, that some of the uh, chemical reactions that they needed in order pro to produce those active uh, drugs ended up being contaminated and it cross-contaminated the product. What we have is new information that suggests with Zantac that the result is actually something that's different. Where the chemical, the active ingredient, the chemical structure itself, as it's breaking down, can actually form that cancer causing chemical. So that means that Zantac will never be coming back out on the US market. Where the other ones, the FDA knows that if they can tighten up what the requirements are, for them to assay the drug and to you know do that safety check, that things will be okay. With Zantac, that's not the uh, uh, that's not the case. Things are a little bit different, um, and we have that. And then uh, the one that came out on Monday, and if you go to any of the ones that I have on the conversation, you can see all the articles that uh, that I wrote. I was looking at heavy metal contamination of uh, of baby food. So there was a uh, congressional report, and I don't know if you saw it in the uh, in the news, but they were saying that there was uh, you know terrible you know because 95% of uh, of baby foods had heavy metals in them, but the reality is they have extremely low concentrations uh, of these heavy metals, and it's probably not an issue. Um, but there are some things you can do for your infants in order to be able to uh, to reduce their exposure to heavy metals. And the biggest ones would be uh, not trying to use rice cereal because rice based products have a lot more heavy metals in them than oats or wheat or quinoa. Uh, and then root vegetables like carrots and sweet potatoes have more heavy metal contamination in them than uh, other types of vegetables. So with rice products, you should probably stay away from them in kids that are under one year of age for the root vegetables. You can have them a couple days a week, but intermingle them within other uh, vegetables so that you're reducing your overall exposure. So if you uh, 
end up if you're uh, on Twitter, if you sign up under uh, my Twitter account, any of the things that I have coming out uh, in the news, I'll put on. Um, I'll put on there as well. When COVID is over, I'll probably be going back and doing the Ask the Pharmacist segment on Fox 61 again, where uh, uh, once to twice a week I was uh, going down to their studio and uh, you know providing drug information to uh, to the public. But that ended up getting preempted by uh, by COVID-19. Well, I hope you can go back to doing that. And by the way, every time you say heavy metal, I can't help but think of my children's heavy metal music period when they were all in heavy <laughs> metal bands. <laughs> yes, yeah, okay, so well, we're talking about uh, we're talking about arsenic and lead and uh, you know cobalt and other stuff that you wouldn't like to have in your food. But the reality is that it's naturally occurring stuff from the breakdown of rocks and it's in all the soils. And that uh, when we burn fossil fuels, especially coal, that they were throwing all of these uh, heavy metals into the air and it ended up settling out on the soil and going into uh, and going into the water. Um, and it's just an issue that uh, is gonna take a long time to be able to resolve. The good news is that the biggest exposure that most people had to lead was actually from the air. And in the 1980s until the present, the amount of lead that was in the air has been reduced by over 98% by taking lead out of uh, a lot of products, including gasoline and uh, the filters that they now have on many of the coal firing plants and then diversifying the energy that we're using away from coal into other things. It, even natural gas, even though it's still a fossil fuel, uh, has a lot less heavy metal contamination when it is uh, when it's burned than the others. But of course, renewables, um, you know, not throwing heavy metals out into uh, the environment as well. Okay, well, that's that's great news on on that front, and uh, we'd like to thank you again. Um, a very informative talk, uh, and uh, you know, well, we'll uh, we'll close the session. So thanks again, and uh, hopefully we'll see you at a future date, but live. Sounds uh, sounds very good. I'll be glad to uh, see you all then. Thank you for your uh, thank you for your time. Okay, great. Thanks.